Hi, my name is Paul Oakley Stovall. I am the chief writer of Written by Phyllis. My cohort, Marilyn Campbell Lowe, has assisted me. And uh, I got started in theater, like most theater kids, you know, a uh, busy kid looking for something to do, very active. And uh, I was also in a lot of sports, but theater stuck. This notion of taking what I was feeling inside and pushing it out to people and seeing them react. And it wasn't just a, a matter of getting applause or getting uh, adoration. It was seeing that there's an invisible transference of energy. When you're that young, you don't put it in those words. But uh, as I got older, I realized that it wasn't just, you know, something to escape to, or I, I realized there was a power in theater that could really be a political, active, social justice power that I wanted to try and harness for the rest of my life. Listen, being a realist, no one can do, okay, sure, there's an echelon of people who know for sure that they are making theater uh, the sustainable thing for the rest of their lives, but um, I still don't feel that way. I still feel like, you know, Theater is more than just fun. It is more than just work. It is a responsibility. And uh, I, I, I actually don't do it to make a living. Um, but I guess I realized that I could when I got my first equity job in Chicago at the Goodman Theater. I said, oh, this is enough. You know, you're just doing the math, you know? This is enough to pay my rent and I don't have to work a second job. But then you have to sustain that, you know? Theater is, it's very powerful. And, and, and you, you understand how powerful it is when you see that people are trying to dismantle it. The same way that teachers to this day still don't get paid. There are babysitters who get paid better rates than teachers. Theater practitioners are constantly, we're constantly being barraged with the idea that what we do is not needed. You know, that, you know, who can afford to do that? I don't want to sit there and listen to that. So it's a responsibility to keep it going. I mean, storytelling was the first way that we separated ourselves from other animals. Um, you know, you, the, the women would go out on the hunt and they would come back and people would sit around the fire and they would tell everyone about it. And that, that was theater, just telling the story of what just happened that you didn't see. But we're going to tell you in a way that makes you feel like you're there. You're going to feel like you're on the hunt. You're going to be afraid. You're going to be uh, joyous when you successfully catch the, the prey. It gets people together in a room, together feeling the same thing, but most likely feeling a different way about it. And what I mean by that is a lot of times they'll laugh in the same spot, they'll cry in the same spot, they will reflect in the same spot. They'll cheer for the same character. And, and we're all just in a room together. It's just a four-wall room that we're sitting in together. But after the show's over, each one of those people will have a different experience of it. The way they tell it to their friend will be different. So you simultaneously have the same experience in a collective environment, but you're having an individual spiritual experience that no one else in the room is having but you because you're bringing your life experience to it. You know, when I see you on stage, I think instantly before you open your mouth, I have a reaction. What has been my experience with that type of person dressed that way in that period? Uh, and then as the show goes on, we're collectively having this experience together as each character comes on. But we're also having our own personal experience with what that story means to us. It enters our dream space. I, I've written several, of the biggest of which is uh, called Immediate Family, that was directed by Phyllis Richard at the Goodman and at Marte Perform. But I've made, I've cut my theater career in Chicago. I've written a new musical that was just a uh, workshop at Porchlight Theater called Clear. And I've written several smaller plays that were done in like, you know, Chicago has a rich history of storefront theaters. And so I've been um, affiliated with several of those and they've done my work. You know, my wonderfully, brutally honest answer to when I first became fascinated with Phyllis is that I don't, 
quite remember. I know she had been in my consciousness. I, I had a volume of poetry published when I was 16. So poetry has been something that I'm into. But then, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think I went through college going, ooh, Phyllis Wheatley. And it, it was fairly recently. I was, I was in Hamilton and um, I was doing an interview and I was asked if you could go back to that time period and I played George Washington. They said, who, who would you want to have dinner with? And Phyllis was one of the people I named. I know that my mother has a great fascination with her. My mother uh, was an English teacher and a humanities professor for many years. So, you know, that book has been on the shelf in our house for years. And then something about someone who I felt seemed so misunderstood was fascinating to me. Someone whose genius was questioned by many was fascinating to me. And then the artistic director here, Alex Burns, approached me and said, hey, would you want to take that poetry and make it into a play? I have formed a nascent group called New Classics Collective with our director, Cheryl Lynn Bruce and uh, Marilyn Campbell, which wants to excavate material that doesn't often get looked at and, and fashion it into new classics. Um, that's one of our missions. The other is to uh, find works that already exist that just don't get done because they're written by women in a period where women weren't recognized as writers. They were written by enslaved people when no one would have ever produced that. So we're on the hunt for pieces that already exist somewhere that we would present as is, no editing, no adapting. Uh, but this is our first, this is our first production. I had this crazy idea born out of feeling a bit snubbed the way I talk about Phyllis. Um, I had a great career in Chicago theater. <laughs> I had a great career in Chicago theater and um, I couldn't get hired at any of the classic theaters like Chicago Shakespeare Theater or anything like that. Now I hadn't studied it, but I figured, you know, I can do it, but I wasn't getting the opportunity. And so, you know, a, a little dose of ego is healthy, I think. So there was a little <laughs> bruised ego in there that I couldn't even get seen for this stuff. And um, at our annual, you guys have the Barrymore Awards. We have the Jefferson Awards, the Jeff Awards. And I was asked to be a presenter uh, one year. And I, I knew I'd have the microphone in front of the entire Chicago theater community. So I stood up. I Before I announced the nominees for whatever award, I think it was Best New Work, I told my co-presenter, hey, I'm going to say a little something first. And he was like, yeah, whatever, go ahead. So I stood up there and I said, you know, <laughs> I see that Shakespeare seems to be the only person that we feel writes classical material or Moliere or, uh, and the like. So I'm forming the New Classics Collective, which will ex excavate, and I went on and said it. People burst into cheers. I didn't know that that would be the reaction, but I thought it was, I was gonna kind of say it as a joke. But then, you know, as I've said to this cast who, who, have, who still marvel that this thing is happening, I say, well, you have to say things out loud because then that'll make it come true. Um, but be careful what you say out loud because then you have to do it. Um, so make sure your dreams are what you want. Make sure what you're saying is what you want. You know, make sure the words coming out of your mouth aren't hurting people and that you're being proactive and making the world a better place. And I think you can manifest what you want. I love a good manifest moment, as Sasha Kofi would say. I love just sitting around with uh, colleagues, with you, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll have some coffees and drinks and just manifest your dreams. What do you want? Um, I think Phyllis manifested, whether on purpose or not, her, her being published and taken to London. You know, the things she, the, but just for the work she was doing, you know, do positive things with your hands. There's a great quote that says, <clears throat> I'm gonna make sure I get this right. Choose work which does not die when you do. Choose work which may bring you honor. Choose work which, by imitating nature, makes you worthy of who you are. That is, a grandchild of God. So I try to keep that in my life, that at every turn, what kind of work am I trying to put into the world? So then it doesn't matter to me what critics say or even what people say. None of it matters if you're choosing work that is putting your fingers in the dirt. Then 
It's all worth it. But Get Lit is actually was like step three of five in getting written by Phyllis onto the main stage here. I forget, I think it was Marilyn that actually, or, or Cheryl came up with that title. We want new, daring, risky works. You know, uh, one of our next works is called Fire, and I think that's where we actually got the idea for Get Lit. We want people's imaginations to be sparked. It's one of the first lines in Written by Phyllis that's, that comes from one of her poems. Imagination. We, we want people to be re-energized. We, we've gone through a tough period where people have to be at home and um, be frustrated and be at a loss for words. Literally at a loss for words and sitting quietly for many, many hours. And as we come out of that, we've got to re-spark the imagination. So Get Lit, we hope, will bring works from all over the country, the world, in fact, eventually, and will foster a great sharing of ideas so that I may come with a half-baked idea about you know, this person holding a red coffee cup and orange shorts, whatever. And then this person says, oh, that might fit into my thing because the one thing that was missing from mine was I couldn't think of like what color the coffee cup would be and what color the shorts would be. Oh yeah, take that idea. Take that idea. So that we're really having a sharing and knitting of ideas. That's what I hope Get Lit can become, a spark for creativity. And that goes right back to the, the metaphor of sitting around the fire hearing stories. I was surprised about what I learned about her time in London. You know, I, I'm guilty. When I think of enslaved people, I think of the South, first of all, um, other than Frederick Douglass. I, I, just, I usually think of the South. And so I was surprised at the type of life an enslaved person sometimes could live, because I'm not saying every enslaved person in the North was having the life Phyllis was having, absolutely not. But I was surprised to find that as I dug around, uh, meeting characters like Scipio and Moorhead, these people who existed, who we know nothing about. I, I was sort of, so I was a little surprised at how robbed I felt of education. But then I, I wasn't surprised because I understood that that's the goal in, in, in some arenas. Um, the biggest challenge was to integrate her poetry into the script so that it wasn't scene, 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 Phyllis performs a poem. Scene, scene, Phyllis performs a poem. But to integrate them into a scene where she's reading from her poem at a salon in London, and so that reading would be in the scene, she may be a little shy about the words, and then she uses one of her poems to spontaneously stop an argument between two people. And you recognize as the audience, oh, that's one of her poems, but the way that we do it, she's just speaking it as if it's prose. So that was a fun adventure to find different ways to use her work. And like I just said before, to sort of knit it together with the playing fast and loose that I was doing with history. You know, there, there's no recorded conversations. There's some letters that she wrote. Um, there are some, you know, uh, essays that Ignatius Sancho wrote. But I'm... I'm I'm putting my words into these people's mouths. So I'm putting my wishes and hopes for what the world can be within, you know, in the mouths of these characters. I'm playing fast and loose. But a lot of writers do that. And that's okay. I'm also not just uh, you know, putting my politics in and doing a fantasy of what I... I am using my imagination of what that conversation could have been and sure, what I maybe hope that it was. It's, it's visionist history. I'm putting a vision forward that I hope will inspire people to then go say, oh, I want to research Ignatius Sancho and even more his wife, Anne Osborne. Like she had a different last name than him. Huh, I want to go dig around and see what I can find. So it's a vision that I'm sharing. Not Because there is no revision because there's very little, you know, these people are kept away from us for a reason. Yeah. I really don't think it influenced my work as an artist, but it influenced me as a person and a human. Um, and so
and seeing what my responsibilities are as a, as a human being in this world. Which I guess then does affect your art because it's not that I'm out there doing kumbaya, putting out just, I have to put out positive things because, you know, you know they, had, they had bad days, I have bad days, we all have bad days. I think that it'll sound cliche, but you know, Mrs. Obama is now, for better or for worse, known for saying, when they go low, we go high. So it's not, it's not that I live that at every moment of my life. It, that's pretty hard to do. That's, you're in Jesus territory, or whatever, you know, people would say, a la Buddha territory. It's that I, I, I take more time, I'm more measured, I'm less concerned with what people have to say about me. These are all things I just learned from watching them. They couldn't do that. They couldn't have done what they did if they let the highs get too high or the lows get them too low. So there was a consistency that being on the periphery of the periphery, because believe me, earlier you said that I worked with them. I did not work with them. I worked for the team that worked with the team. You know, it was like that. <laughs> I was over in the corner. But I was at a close enough vantage point that I saw how they operated. And, you know, there were many times where I would have direct contact or I would be called upon to handle something quickly. And you could feel a lot of pressure, like how new plays go into Tech Week and you make lots of changes. But I, so I think if I took anything from them, it's be consistent, stay calm, believe in yourself, know that you wouldn't be in the place you're in if you weren't ready to do it. And don't worry too much about what other people have to say. I want people to come see this play because we don't have enough material out there that it, it is, you know, first of all, brand new. You know, I'm just so thrilled that Quintessence is supporting a world premiere. They're very hard to do. And I think that we need to start gathering again. And we need to start gathering around things like poetry, things like history things that have been right in front of us that we may not have known. You know, Philadelphia, I mean, God, you know, the birthplace of so much history. You, you can watch any play and then go like out into the street and, and find out more about it in, in Philadelphia um, and this, this part of the country. So just come and have a good time with us, no expectations. Um, so then you can't have disappointments that way. And uh, come and enjoy, yeah.